What's shaking, everybody? Luke Dancy here, and I am joined by one of the greatest living magicians of our time, the one and only Mr. Michael Amor. Mr. Amor, how are you, sir? I'm fine, Luke. What a nice thing to say. Luke uh, Dancy. That's true. Long yeah. time no see. Saw you in Blackpool a few months ago, um, but it was, a, it was just a brief hello. It was quick because he was too busy lecturing for a thousand plus people in the arena, and he's just Michael Amor, but... We definitely got to see each other and say hello. Um, and Tell you what, man. You walk out to a Blackpool lecture, and it's like, <laughs> as far as you can see people, and it's like, man, you know? It's that classic thing. I wish I had a better act, you know? Oh, whatever. <laughs> you are uh, absolutely uh, one of the nicest guys in Magic, but you're also one of the most skilled performers, uh, one of the most uh, well-known lecturers throughout the world. Um, this is what kicked it all off for me. Michael Amor. I've got this queued up here. This is you looking on to the massive Easy to Master Card Miracles <laughs> series. <laughs> Look at that. Uh, nice, nice, nice collection. It's a <laughs> little tower of goodness there. Uh, all those beautiful, beautiful things that are now actually available on download. I want people to know that. We're not here to talk just about product, but one of the beautiful things with technology is people can now download those and start learning this stuff from home, which is really cool. Yep. Yeah. No, I've got a, a download site, worldsgreatestmagic.com. Nice. Worldsgreatestmagic.com. And uh, we broke those down into individual tricks. So you can, like, watch the trick and then decide if you want to buy it. And it's just really affordable. And it's, you know, it's, it's the way to go. Yes, sir. Uh, we've got some people already giving some love. And you guys, too, while well, we do these live, obviously, is so that you guys can ask questions. And you can connect with people just like this. And Ben has a nice comment over on YouTube. He says, the most influ influential mind in close-up magic from his generation. And I agree with that a thousand percent. Oh, you know, as well. sounds like those bribes are paying off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Patrick over on Facebook says uh, that the easy to master card miracles uh, are still the go-to for many card tricks that he does. And it's true. There's so much gold on those, so much gold, I man. Really, I mean, it wasn't, and it wasn't just me. We had a little team of guys that, you know, were brainstorming on what would be the best collection of stuff. And, uh, you know, I thought seven, eight, and nine it was as good as one, two, and three, and, and that's how we wanted to do it. We, we didn't want to make it seem like we were running out of good material. So some of that stuff we had held on to, you know, to make sure that we finished strong. And um, I'm just really proud of the work I did with l and L. Lewis really knew how to produce a video, I tell you. You know, he, he had a great setup there. The, the crew, artist, everybody stayed right there at his home. And we didn't leave the place until everything was done. And he had food catered. And it was just uh, a, a, the perfect way to do it. Nice. I mean, we miss those. At least I miss those. And the crowds, the L&L &L crowds. You must have become friends with them over yeah. the years. <laughs> I did, you know, and I, I saw, you know, plus I hosted, you know, maybe 50 other titles. Uh, I would come up and, and just kind of interview the guys that uh, the other artists, stuff like that. So, I, yeah, I got to know those that audience really well. You know, people used to think, well, how did you get such a good audience? And it, it was tough, you know, to get people to come up there at the beginning. He advertised in the newspaper. Do you want to see a great magic show? Free. Now, in fact, you'll get fifty. We'll pay you fifty dollars because we're going to videotape it. And uh, he kept track of the people that were good audiences. And if they were a good audience, he said, "Come back next week, and uh, we have another artist." And before you know it, he had a he had a really strong list of performers. That was our first. Those uh, these we uh, Mike Maxwell had hired those three. Uh, uh, three or four girls mm -hmm. uh, to be there, and we just thought it was, it was just too too many women, and and that guy was walking by the place, uh, <laughs> and we, we uh, he said, hey, you want to see some magic? Come on in. And so we just lassoed this guy at the very last minute uh, to come in and, and balance the audience out. Uh, uh, but um, yeah, I mean uh, Murphy's. Uh, this is uh, you're working with Murphy's here. I mean, that's one name that uh, Mark Murphy and I had in common was uh, Mike Maxwell. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we both uh, uh, knew Mike in the early days, and yeah, and he passed away just in, in the last year. Yeah, 
Very sad. Very sad. Yeah. But that's, you know, that's the beautiful thing about having things like this to watch. And I know you said you haven't even watched some of this footage in, in quite a long time. Um, this brings back so many mem memories for me growing up. I mean, you were like the figure. You, you were the guy that you would go to the magic shop and there was the, the Michael Lamar set, whether it's the Top It stuff, the coin, uh, the, the money magic, the business card, like all of it. The Amar world of stuff. This is like such a well, nice you know, the, reminder. It's cool. We had no idea that videos could sell. That you know, at, when we started putting these out, we'd more or less given up on video as a good learning medium <laughs> uh, because they were expensive, and uh, you know, they were basically just filming people's lectures, uh, and so it wasn't dynamic. It didn't have live audiences and things like that. Um, but we really hit. The right formula with this and you know this so 1990 91 that sort of thing up until then um the tarbell course was still the best selling books in magic after a year because as soon as the, the magic shop owners saw that somebody was serious they say well now you now if you're really serious you got to get this set of books mm -hmm. and that was their big recommendation and for the first time, those videotapes became the recommended thing. Uh, and, you know, it was that thing that they could recommend. Oh, if you're really interested, you got to get this set of uh, videotapes. And that's that's the reason it, it worked out so good. Uh, we're getting a lot of love for you out here. Uh, Ray Coleman uh, is saying that uh, you are the good to the magician. You're basically the magician's magician. Obviously, you perform a lot for uh, the lay public as well and on TV. Um, but a lot of love yeah. from you, especially from the magicians out there. Yeah, I love that. And I love that, uh, you know, on YouTube, they collect these comments and I can go back and check them later on. So I may not be able to see them now while we're talking, but later on, I'll be able to go back and, and see all of these. And so please feel free to leave me some messages because I, I will see them even if I can't see them right now. Absolutely. Um, and, and speaking of you as a performer, uh, a little blast from the past here. This is a little more recent. Uh, this is you on the David Letterman show. Not too recent, but more recent than the other picture I have. Um, exactly. Man. Boy, wow. talk about a jaded eye. Letterman. <laughs> I have heard that he's for a, so long. He's a really tough yeah. spectator, huh? And it's true, right? It's got to be true. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, uh, I've done the Tonight Show and a bunch of Merv Griffin shows and some other Will Schreiner and stuff like that. And what they always say is, we want you to have a good show. If you have a good show, we'll have a good show. And that's the way they looked at it. But with Letterman, it really was just a matter of, we just want this to be interesting. Mm -hmm. And if we can make you look like an idiot, that's really interesting. <laughs> so, it, I mean, it, it was a, just a different attitude uh, with, with Letterman. Um, but... Uh, you know, I, I came through all right, I think. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would definitely I would definitely say so. And this one, this person I'm about to show, I believe was a little bit more, I wouldn't say forgiving, but a little bit more of a fan of magic. I'm talking about this guy, Johnny Carson. Well, there it is, boy, yeah. You know, and Johnny was the nicest one of all of them. He's the only one that you got to see before you went out. He, he actually, after I rehearsed, uh, he I was in the dressing room, uh, and I heard a knock on the door, and I said, "Come in." And you know, he cracked the door open. Goes, uh, "So, are you busy?" <laughs> <laughs> no, come on in. And uh, he said, "Hey, you know, they told me that you did some really interesting things at rehearsal. Uh, you know, I'm a magician. Uh, yeah, I know that." And he says, uh, "You got a deck of cards on you?" Yeah, and uh, I gave him a deck of cards, and the guy sat there and did card tricks for me for about 15 minutes. <laughs> wow, uh, that's cool. That wow. <laughs> wow, that's really cool. Oh, he passed away. His nephew inherited his props, and he made a point of sending a really nice props, uh, one of his really nice props to uh, several of the magicians that had appeared on the show with, uh, you know, some of the stationery, his business card, and a, just a thank you card letter about, you know, how Johnny always loved to have the magicians on, and here's a little chance to have a piece of Johnny's magic, and 
And uh, I mean, uh, how nice is that? That's amazing. That is absolutely it, it amazing. Is. It yeah. really is. It's really, really cool. Um, speaking of amazing, a lot of people are saying that you are uh, like one of their favorite magicians. You're a true master of the art. Obviously, we all know that. Um, we even have people watching from overseas. They're staying up late for this. It's almost 2 a.m. Uh, Vimal, our friend Vimal, is in London. He's hanging out. Just want to give some love out there. To oh, how nice. Across the, uh, the pond there. Very yeah, cool. we may have seen him at Blackpool Very true. a few months ago. Very true. Uh, we've had some questions coming in as well. Um, one of them was, dun, da, 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 uh, here it comes, Jack Stone. This is a great question. I want to know this one too. Uh, Jack wants to know, how did it feel working with the professor? Obviously, you had a very close relationship with him. Uh, if you could share a little bit about that relationship, that'd be really cool to hear. You know, um, I, I first met uh, the professor at the Las Vegas Magic Seminars, you know, the Desert Magic Seminars back in the late 70s. And they would feature um, the professor and, and um, Tony Slidini. And I was just amazed that, that they could get these people to appear at a convention that maybe only a few hundred people would be at. Yeah. And as soon as I got there, man, I made a beeline just to hang around this guy and just try to be close to him and introduce myself and, uh, and wait for the right time to ask if he'd like to see a magic trick. And, you know, he was just so gracious. I, I, I think happy to see a young guy that was enthusiastic and passionate about magic. And, and whenever he'd make a comment about something, I always made a point of, the next time I saw him, showing him that I took his advice seriously. And by the second or third time I saw him, he started to recognize me and and kind of enjoyed having me hang out with him because everybody would want him him to do a trick. And uh, they'd come over and ask him to sign some stuff and eventually they'd say, well, can you perform a little something? Well, here, uh, he'll show you a little something. <laughs> and then you know, I, I would do some stuff. So I think he liked that I took a some of the pressure off of him uh, in those situations. But yeah, it was like a dream. You know, growing up in West Virginia, I, I just had books and things like that mm. to count on. And, and to read these books and then be able to meet these people live was like a dream. It was like a dream come true. And um, so when people come up to me and say, hey, I've studied your stuff and it's a pleasure to meet you. I understand exactly how that feels because that was exactly how I was. And when these guys would be gracious to me and were polite and, and willing to share with me, I mean, I feel like I'm just kind of, you know, giving back what I got uh, from so many of the greats of magic. And he was definitely a uh, huge figure that he didn't really surround himself with a whole lot of people. And that's what's really cool about you is that you were kind of one of those in the circle, you know, that yeah. people only yeah. hear about, which is pretty cool. Um, and you know, I, again, I always made a point of finding him and just kind of sticking like glue. <laughs> it just didn't go away, you know. Uh, and he was always very gracious, though. And, um, and just, um, and really, you like to see somebody that would take things like classics, like the cups and balls or the linking rings, and not do it exactly the way that he did it. Uh, and he kind of appreciated, well, there you go. So, I mean, uh, that cups and balls routine was developed, you know, primarily to show him that I wasn't using any of the sequences that he had developed, that all of that stuff was completely different than anything but he got, and I think that he appreciated that. Nice. And uh, for those that don't know, I'm going to give a little love here. Uh, this that we're looking at is from the World's Greatest Magic TV series that aired many moons ago. I look forward to them every single year. They, they came out around Thanksgiving every year, if I'm not mistaken. But there's an even deeper story. This is around the time when you were doing Caesar's Magical Empire, which I unfortunately never got to see with my own eyes. I heard it was amazing. Oh, such a nice place, such a beautiful place for magic. And, um, you know, I was right on top of my game there. Uh, both of the effects that I did on this world's greatest magic was the cups and balls 
and the rollover aces. Um, they said, let's, let's film it once um, just to see if the cameras are all in the right place and everything. And uh, then we'll give it a, a real go uh, afterwards. And uh, Gary Willett told me these were the only two effects in the history of performing those series that they used on the first take. You know, that was the first take. The roll of races was on the first take. Wow. And again, was, I was performing five or six shows a night, six nights a week, uh, right there at the, the Magical Empire. And that's where they filmed this. So, yeah, yeah I was on top of my game. You First take for both tricks. Yeah, first take on both of them, yeah. Damn, that's that's crazy. Wow, wow, wow. Um, and the, the Magical Empire, this is where it's shot, right? You're in the place, you're in part of the... Uh, the Magical Empire right now, right? When they were filming this, this is part of it, yeah? Yes, and now that table is kind of a triangle. And uh, they wanted me to film at the wide part mm -hmm. of the triangle. And uh, I said, no, let's turn it around so that more people are in the frame cool. and more people are closer. See, otherwise, you know, all those close people would have been further away. And again, that was the first time that they'd... Uh, filmed anything like that you know with a table turned backwards mr amor i have to ask you a question i'm going to back this up for just a second who was that in the back over your left corner there i think i recognize that pretty <laughs> face there. appearance by uh, hannah <laughs> the lovely hannah yep you know she looks exactly the same right now it's uh, it's nice. the magic our family's you know francis willard yep. is her mother and uh, her sister and her brother are very attractive as well. You know, I remember thinking our kids are going to have a, at least a 50-50 chance to be good you know, with, uh, with her team there. <laughs> you know what's really cool, um, something we don't have to necessarily show, but it's pretty interesting that behind you is a piece of, it goes back a long way, you know, the history. Right. This is the spirit cabinet. Uh, That's really cool. That um, we were going to do the spirit cabinet uh, this year at the Magic Castle. We had uh, flown out to L.A. We we're going to be in It's Magic and then start performing at the in the palace. The first time I'd ever be in the palace at the Magic Castle, and um, we we're going to feature the, the spirit cabinet. And it was March sixteenth was going to be our first day that Monday and that's the day that they closed uh, due to the virus and, and it's magic uh, canceled uh, because of the virus and it was such a shame because you know Hannah was was ready to go man she she had done her homework and she looked beautiful and you know it, we can't wait for the castle to open up again uh, uh, to have a chance to go back I'm yeah. you know I'm just wondering how all that's going to turn out, you yeah. know, with the virus and none of us know. The yeah. stuff and you know the Magic Castle. None of those rooms are huge, mm -hmm. but everybody goes up and down the same staircase and up and down the same uh, hallways. And the close-up room is really close up, <laughs> uh, which is part of the, what made the castle special. It was probably the first place in the world that gave close-up performers a legitimate showroom. Their own dressing room, their own host to introduce them, and uh, a parlor so that you can do the stand-up magic and the stage and the place to perform behind the bar. It was like the only place that catered to all the venues, uh, the performance arenas for magic. Oh. And um, I just had my fingers crossed that uh, they're gonna come up with a vaccine or something you know yeah. actually I went back and I was reading about the the Spanish flu from 1918 mm -hmm. uh, they didn't come up with a vaccine for the Spanish flu it went on for about three years and then it did just disappear because basically everybody had caught it hmm. Every, you know you either died from it or you developed immunity to it and then it disappeared and um, you know, I thought Trump was out of his mind when he said, it'll disappear, it'll go away. But it, it might do something like that once enough people right. have antibodies in their system, then it won't have a chance to spread the way that it needs to. 
uh, to survive. Yeah. So, uh, and and they did all the things a hundred years ago that we're doing now. They uh, they wore masks. They did the social distancing. They closed the schools. They closed the businesses, and they basically starved it. Well, hopefully sooner than later, uh, everything we're dealing with will be just a memory, and we can all learn something from it. Hopefully, yeah. Um, yeah. But something fun I want to bring up real quick to you, Mr. Michael Amar. I hope you're ready. Oh, my man! A little blast from the past here. Got some Amar facts that. <laughs> I, that's exactly what I wanted. The little, little bit of laughter there. How so <laughs> now, unfortunately, the website doesn't seem to exist anymore. Um, but oh, what a I, fun thing! I managed to find some. Uh, if you guys don't know, there was a thing about eight years ago, maybe a little longer, where people were making the comparison that Michael Lamar is kind of like the Chuck Norris of magic. And <laughs> so these are a few lines that I thought I would share and ask Michael maybe what some of his favorites were over that time. Um, the first one was, Michael Amar can do a Charlie A cut with just one card. Yes. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. Uh, the next one here, Michael Amar can do a spring with 52 decks of cards. <laughs> All right. Um, Michael Amar can do card on ceiling without the ceiling. <laughs> Outdoors. You know, I went to Sorcerer Safari. Uh, one year, this, this may have been 10 years ago, and we actually did the card on ceiling outside, and uh, exactly as it would be described. Uh, <laughs> I had um, a big helium balloon, huge helium uh, with a really long string, and it was a black balloon, and it was dusk, so you couldn't see, the and, and a ball of wax that was stuck outside. And so I, we were indoors, and I uh, had the audience, everybody come outside, outside. And, and under cover of that, I stuck that wax to the card, you know. And then I sprung the, the cards into the air, and then that card kind of hoovered there for a second, and then just <laughs> floated up until it went out of sight. And uh, it was a nice moment. <laughs> <laughs> so you made that a reality, which so, is great. So, Inspired by the uh, the Amar facts, there. <laughs> um, Michael Amar can do symbol with fifty two coins. <laughs> um, Michael Amar can back palm his own hand, his own hand. <laughs> God. Uh, let me see if there are any other favorites here. Uh, those are just a few of the highlights. But um, did you ever find out? In all seriousness. Who was behind MRFacts.com? Do you ever find that out? Yeah, boy, I, the names escape me at the moment. I think Jason Dean was one of the guys. Okay. Uh, the D&D &D guys, the Double D guys. Uh, and um, I'm spacing out on uh, uh, the other guy's name. But uh, it was it was a labor of love. I mean, those are really great guys. Yeah, that was uh, when that was going on, it was like everywhere. It was It was a lot of fun, so... Um, speaking yeah, of fun I wish times, I could remember some of them. Oh, go ahead. so long I can't remember some. Of them. It's really funny. Yeah, and I'm glad that when I brought it up, it, it brought some some joy to you there because it's definitely a lot of fun to us too. So yeah. Um, speaking of fun times, Michael Mayo's got a great question. I'd love to hear some insight into. Um, I would love to hear about your brainstorm in the Bahamas and your time with the other magic hedonists. So brainstorm in the Bahamas. Uh, wow. Yeah. Boy, that was. You know, it was such a good idea. You know, the, the basis of that comes straight out of Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich, uh, where it talked about developing a mastermind group, that if you get together with a group of like-minded individuals and put yourself in a good environment for creativity, that, that there's a synergy that is created. And every time I hung out with Paul Harris and um, Daryl, and, uh, you know, uh, Richard Kaufman at one time was part of the team. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Adam Fleischer, uh, we would always come up with ideas. And the idea was, what if we went onto some island someplace and spent a week just brainstorming, you know, and it could, could we come up with enough stuff to publish a book? And if it's good enough, maybe the book would finance the 
chance to go to some other exotic place uh, to, to do the same thing. And there's a lot of good stuff in that book. And everything in that book was created that week. That's cool. That's yeah, really, and really. The guy published a book. Oh, uh, I'm spacing out on his name. He's a very creative guy with a beard. Um, but he put out a book it, um, that was called Brainstorm in My Pajamas. Hmm. And, and you know how they had the girl laying on the, the uh, getting a suntan? It was a, a picture <laughs> oh, yeah. of him in his bed with his pajamas. And <laughs> Brainstorm in my pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> There's a picture floating around of you guys hanging out with a girl across you. I remember this, you and Daryl and Paul, Paul Harris. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Very cool. And I won't worry, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> good times, good times. Yeah. Um, of course, this is a family show, which leads me to a question about the younger people. I've had this a couple times. Uh, William Cunnings over on, or Cummings, excuse me, over on uh, Facebook says, Mr. Amar, if you had to give one tip to young magicians get, just getting started in performing in front of live audiences, what would it be? And I know Frankie Valley also asked that about younger, you know, advice for younger people. So, um, yeah, you well, the, you know, the best way to get better quicker is, you know, to th first of all, you, you want to think about what you're going to perform uh, when you go out and, and, and kind of imagine how it should go kind of think how you're going to go into it and how you're going to come out of it. You know, just don't learn the, the, the body of the thing, but how you're going to bring it up in conversation and how you're going to end it. And then after you perform, think about it. You know, what went right? What went wrong? What could have been better? What surprised you? What surprised them? I used to have a, a, a sheet that, that I would fill out every show here's all the tricks i'm going to do in this show here's the audience it's going to be for and here's what i think is going to go the best and here's what i think you know i'm going to get out of this show and then after the show i would say now what worked what didn't work what could be better you know what should i leave out do i need a better opening do i need a better closing and i think that if you just take your experiences and try and squeeze as much out of them as you can you know, I've seen guys that have been in Magic 30 years and they're still not that good because they, they have one year of experience 30 times and they, uh, they, they don't really squeeze it to, to find out what's working and what's not working. Uh, but I think that you can get 30 years of experience in three years if you really think about it uh, and, and, and try to get to learn from every experience. Um, you know, I, I think you learn, you learn more from one real performance than you do from two weeks of practice mm -hmm. or a month just thinking about it. So every performance gives you a chance to, to really learn more than any rehearsal uh, will give you. And this is a great example here. We're watching you. This is one of my favorite tricks. I used to do this all the time when I did walk around work. This is a one coin flurry sequence with a nice jumbo coin kicker at the ending. And just like you're saying, the only way to get better about this stuff is to get out and do it. And here you are literally surrounded by people with just a coin. <laughs> you know, that's that's all David Roth's inspiration. You know, David Roth was just so far ahead of everyone with the coin magic back in the 70s and the 80s. Just a real inspiration to so many people and still a dear friend. Uh, speaking of inspirations, uh, I want to give you some love here, Michael. Uh, our friend Eric Treese out there says, um, I never considered performing until I went to my very first magic lecture, which was Michael Lamar. So you've inspired people to just oh, start performing. Nice. You know, I love the magic lectures. It's, it's the best of both worlds. You get to perform and then you get to talk about the thinking that went into it. You know, I, I think a good magic lecture should be as good as any performance could be. It, it, it should be better because, again, you get to do both. You get to talk about how amazing some of these secrets are. Now, you, you have to think about how to make the explanations interesting and entertaining, uh, but there's, there's no reason for a magic lecture to be boring. 
It should be a sit on the edge of your seat all the way through it. And, you know, I remember the first time I did a, a, a magic lecture, and then all these guys wanted to buy lecture notes, and I'm sitting here thinking, how long has this been going on? Well, this is great, you know. This is, I love this. And um, I just I can't wait till it comes back because, you know, I, I got one more tour, global tour, in my system uh, before I, you know, but even that would take five or six years. So it's not like I'm looking to retire anytime soon. Uh, if you really go around and do the U.S. and each of the countries, you know, it, it would take four or five years. But I, I'd like to do it one more time before that whole thing just kind of disappears. You know, magic clubs aren't what they used to be. Sure. You know. Well, I, I don't think I enjoy hearing the word retire out of your mouth. So. I, don't, I hope yeah, that doesn't happen for a very, a very long time. time. You know, but but touring, okay. uh, the idea of really going out and doing 25 cities in 28 days, that kind of thing, yeah. it, it's it's kind of a young man's game, man, because it's, sure. it's a marathon. Um, and again, to say, you know, I'll devote four or five more years to it. I'd love to say I'm going to be doing it uh, when I'm the professor's age, yes. uh, doing lectures. That's what we but, want. That's what we want. But I'm just concerned everything's going to change. Yeah. That's my, my concern. You know, all these kids are learning stuff on YouTube and uh, and online, and I just don't know if 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 the infrastructure for for doing a tour and going around in every city uh, is is going to survive. I'd li I'd love to think so, because there's nothing like you know back in the day though. If you wanted to see a guy do something, some routine or some scene, you had to be in the room when he did it, or you didn't get to see it, you know? Um, so that's, and, and the chance for a top magician to come into your city and uh, do this sort of thing is was amazing. Absolutely, and I think your camera is frozen there. You might want to turn it off and turn it back on real quick on your computer there. I'll, okay, uh, let's see. I'll just come back to my uh, shot real yeah. quick. And yeah, if you want to just restart that. Yeah, there you are. There you go. Just like magic, back to normal. Wow. Voilà. <laughs> you know, it's like I was telling you, we're having a thunderstorm yep. here in, in Florida, and that can affect this reception. So let's see what happens. Yep. Well, we've got a few more minutes with you here and I won't keep you past that. Like I promise you, it's like 30, 45 minutes here. So we're at, we're over the 30 minute mark. So my friend, uh, I could do this all day with you. You know that. Well, it's definitely appreciated. And, um, you know, everything that you're saying about things changing and magic clubs, um, I will say one thing, you know, there is no substitute for what you bring to the table. Any of the masters that we have, um, the wealth of knowledge and the wisdom that they can share with people is priceless. And I feel like the need for that will always exist. Maybe I, I in, hope so. Yeah, that's just my guess. Uh, I don't know everything, of course. Um, but of course, I was just joking about the whole retirement thing. But I will say out loud, magic needs you. Magic loves you. Magicians love you. And it's true. You know, during, this, during these amazing days, a lot of guys are doing Zoom magic shows. You know, I haven't done that. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I worry about it. And uh, here's, here's my metaphor for that. You know, I, I love sushi, love going to a good sushi bar. But then we discovered you could buy sushi at the grocery store. Oh, great. So we started getting sushi at the grocery store, which is not as good mm -hmm. as getting it to, at a good sushi bar. But after two or three months of eating grocery store sushi, I thought, well, I guess sushi's not as good as I thought it was. And I quit eating sushi for a couple of years. And I see in the, a good sushi bar and I go in and I go, oh, I'm, it's, it is great. It's just not great from the grocery store. Mm -hmm. Now, my concern is if they see a lot of Zoom magic shows, that certain clients will start to think that's what magic is like. And uh, is, oh, I, magic's not as good as I thought it was. Uh, you know, when really magic, needs to be experienced live you know there's nothing like a live magic experience and when you go from 3d to 2d part of the soul i think pops out of it um but you know teaching is still good mm -hmm. because the information is just as good you know uh, uh, i developed this curriculum 
uh, for magic, at Discover Magic. Uh, and it's, it's being run now by uh, Brian South and Michael Rosander. He goes by Michael Mario now. And um, they do such a wonderful job. It's discovermagic.com. And what it is, it's a franchise uh, for teaching magic to kids, kids 8 to 12. And there's all these life skills built into it. And the guys that are in that uh, Discover Magic uh, business model didn't miss a beat. They're doing just as many uh, more now that they've converted it to all to online things because parents are needing something for their kids to do when they're quarantined at home. And it's, it's such a good curriculum and uh, such a good business model. Some of these guys, are the, by far, I mean, it's like their whole business is kind of revolving around the school shows that promote the, the magic classes and then the magic classes. You know, it's uh, uh, teaching magic can be just as effective online, but I think the performance of it is, is a real challenge. Yeah. It's a real challenge. Agreed. There's been a, there's been a few people that have, that have come close. Uh, one name that jumps out, uh, Colin Cloud is doing a really amazing job. But keep in mind, though, I think the reason it works well for him is because he's a mentalist as well. So he does a different style of magic than a lot of yeah. us do. You know, the, the you know, I'm not saying that's impossible. I, I do think that if they really put some time into it, you know, there's uh, um, Anton James uh, yep. up in Austin is doing a great job, and uh, Costa Kemlet uh, here in Orlando uh, really does a great job with it. Uh, I, I just think I, I would be careful. Uh, you know, I've done a few things for some clients, but I've kept it short, and I did it for free. And saying, look, I just want to, you know, do a little something to say hello to everybody. And as soon as this is over, I'd like to come and see you live and, and do the real thing for you. Um, and I'm, I'm just concerned that, uh, yeah, I, it's hard to say what's going to happen with, with all this yep. live stuff. You know? Well, something that people can work on right now when they're at home uh, is a question coming in from Ben, which is about writing and scripting. Um, he says that, uh, Mr. Amar, your scripting is always practical, functional, and on point. What are your thoughts on writing? So what about scripting? Something people can do right now, that you can't perform their shows like they used to, but they can really hone in the presentations right now, which is very Yeah, important. I think about it a lot. Uh, now, from my experience though, I always over script. Okay. Right? When I sit down and I write a script, I always end up with about twice as many words as I end up really saying, uh, as I feel comfortable saying when I'm standing there. And so anymore, I, I try to get a loose outline, a few good lines, and then I want to find some place to try it out live in front of an audience to see how much more I want to bring to it. But one thing that the professor always used to say, how do you go into it? And how do you go come out of it you know so you have to think of some hook line as you're going into it to bring it up and uh, from that point you know everybody needs some place to be bad uh, some place to perform things a few times to really see how much more patter they need than they they come to uh, out with in their outline but um, I, I I love sitting down and writing it but from my experience, I always write too much. I always think I'm going to feel comfortable saying more than I end up saying. You know, I end up just talking instead of talking as I'm doing things and moving the ball forward. And, and you know, that's just my experience. But it's always good to have more than you need. But, um, sure. again, you, you really need to find some place to... to try it out to see how much do you really need to write yep. you know um you, you, you fall in love with your own voice and <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know you end up there uh, saying too much and and i'm sensitive to that you know well that's something that you only realize and get better at by performing and doing and figuring it out as you go right so right and again thinking about it afterwards afterwards now how did that work what what was i at what points was I just there talking and nothing's happening 
uh, kind of thing, you know. So I, I really kind of try to script for a short attention span, and um, is is really good advice because people's attention span is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Now with TikTok and things like that, you know, the, the attention span is like this. You know? Very true. It's very very true. Mm -hmm. Things are definitely changing. Um, if we could touch on the Zoom stuff real quick, do you mind if we take another question on the, the Zoom world, all that stuff? Absolutely. Cool. Uh, Sean brought up a good question here. He says, uh, on your idea with Zoom, does the idea of technology and magic work together or does it take away from the performance? And that could even be without the whole um, Zoom virtual shows. Even tricks and things like that, you really have to be careful. Yeah. Um, and, and that's the danger, you know, to be truly astonished, you have to believe that a certain thing is so. And, you know, it, it's not suspending disbelief. It's finding things that you can really believe. You know, the hand is really empty and now something's in it or the cup is really empty and now there's something in it. And when you start doing it through technology, it's just, I think easy for people to think there's stuff going on that I'm not seeing. Um, you know, I had a chance to speak with Franz Harari a, a few weeks ago, and he was telling me, boy, when I put together these illusions for television, all of the thought and all of the effort goes into convincing people it would look like this if you were standing here. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's too easy for, you know, when the Taj Mahal disappears, they're going to think it's a camera trick. Mm -hmm. You know, for, for that to, to matter at all, somebody has to believe those people standing there are seeing what I'm seeing through the screen. And that's one of the real challenges. Yeah, it certainly is. Um, and uh, here's a good question as we start to wrap up. Frankie Valley would like to know, <clears throat> excuse me, what keeps you going in magic? What keeps you motivated? What keeps you inspired these days after you've done for so long? Well, I still love the experience of performing. I love uh, a good audience, and uh, you know, I I love meeting young guys that are passionate about magic, because I've seen some of these young guys grow up to become really great magicians. And so when I see these young guys, they're truly serious and they're asking the right questions. Man, I I want to give them all the advice I can, yeah, because they stay in magic. Part of them stays in magic. They may get some other job, uh, but they'll always love magic and come back to it later in their life when they can. And um, I just love seeing that process. You know, I knew Eric Mead when he was 13 years old, and I met Lee Asher when he was uh, 11 years old. And, cool. and, and uh, you know, these guys grow up, and they become great magicians. And and also uh, some great magicians were very kind to me so i'm, I'm just paying back so it's kind of a, a two-edged thing uh to want to give in that way because uh, a lot were very kind and very generous to me and i've seen that pay off in spades when these guys grow up and become really great magicians and you just feel you know glad that you gave them a little time yeah that's i mean yeah. a, little, a little bit goes a long way right that's a long yeah. Way. yeah, yeah, um, and I'll say from a, a personal standpoint, um, I had the very uh, huge honor of working with Michael on a TV show that we did together um, here in Las Vegas, and man, we just with Angel on the, the Spike 10, 10 hours of Spike TV. Yeah, man. You know, I gotta say, man, this uh, that guy has one of the best work ethics of anybody I've ever seen. Uh, he was still doing a show there at the Luxor mm -hmm. and working out 10 hours of magic for Spike TV. And this was this is what was amazing. Uh, and you'll remember this. He had already done seven seasons of, of um, The Mind Freak. And now we had to come up with 10 hours of stuff that didn't involve anything that he had done in seven seasons of previous performing. <laughs> and... Boy, you'd, you'd suggest these things, and they oh, yeah, season three. You know, I remembered one thing. I said, oh, what about this? What what if, if a girl does this, and you you give her like an instant, just pulls her shirt out, and now she's got breasts, you give her an instant boob job. Oh, yeah, season three. 
<laughs> wow, well, he's like done everything. It was a lot of fun. Uh, it, it was stressful at times, as as any yeah. TV project is. Um, Deadline: an hour filming, an hour of great magic every week uh, for ten weeks. Yeah, yeah, that was no small thing. And yeah. Jesse, it's a pleasure to work with Jesse and uh, yeah. and. Um, Oh yeah, Stu Stone was there. Oh, Jesse Feinberg. Uh, Stu Stone, uh, what a what a what a nice guy he was. Yep, yep. We had some good times. And Joe, you know, uh, came in and yep. did some stuff. So. Joe Devlin, yeah, an amazing yeah. mind and another just great figure in the magic world. And that's why, more than anything, uh, Michael, I'm I'm sincerely grateful for your time this evening because, as someone that's been inspired directly from you as a magician. And to all of us, uh, what you do, we we respect it, we appreciate it, and I am I am who I am today as a magician, and a big part of that does come from you. And I know a lot of people would say that. So oh, kind, um, you're so kind. You're, you're yeah. definitely keeping the torch more than a lot. I thank you for thinking of me and and let me put, be part of this thing. And uh, anytime you want to do anything else, you know you know I'll be here for you. Well, thank you, sir. And before we get out of here, one last question. I have to ask this because someone asked this earlier. Um, is there some new stuff from you that we might be looking out for sometime down the road? Yeah, you know, I uh, putting out my linking ring routine for the first time. Uh, it should be sometime next month um, cool. through TCC, the, the company in China that produces just the like the finest props you've ever seen. And it'll come in a nice leather bag, these beautiful rings, and uh, we're gonna put it on Kickstarter um, next month, just so we have some idea how many sets of rings to, to produce, because we're just not sure what, what the marketplace is out there. So uh, yeah, it's it's my linking re -return. And you know, uh, very often when I perform for Layman, that's their favorite thing in the show. And um, and I just it's all original stuff, all original moves again because I, I wanted to show the professor that I wasn't going to do just the Symphony of the Rings the way he did it. So everything is different in it from the show of the rings to the uh, to the switch of the rings and everything. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, and this one too. This is one of your more recent things. As we get out of here, this is exquisite. You and Low Standard teamed up. Uh, oh yeah, so nice. Yeah, the floating glass. Yeah. What a nice boy. Well, Sandra makes that thing look like real magic. Two great. Uh, right what a nice moment! <laughs> you get to lift the scarf and see it underneath, and then it floats into their hand. Ah, very nice. Beautiful piece of magic. So that's definitely one of your more recent things. I wanted to drop that in here too because. Um, it's a it's a beautiful piece of magic, and you really can't do that with any glass. You just grab a glass with a stem there, and off you go. So, yeah. Um, and speaking of off we go, it is now time for me to say my goodbyes to you and everyone else. We're going to get out of here together. Uh, we made it through the storm, Mr. Amar. We made it through the thunderstorm over there. So. Very nice. Uh, only one little minor glitch there with the thing, but uh, who knows where the, what that came from? Well, uh, hey, look, it's been a pleasure, my friend. This has been great for me and for everyone else, uh, me more, because I just think you're awesome. Um, but thank you so much uh, for hanging out and chatting with us. Uh, to you and your family, stay safe. And we will hopefully see you sooner than later, my friend, out there in the magic world somewhere. So Let's do it again someday. And the rest of you guys, stay safe, take care of yourself and each other. I will catch you next time. And if you haven't yet, make sure you say live in the comments. So every time we do go live, you will be the first to know. See you guys. Right.